in the fullness of time, each of you should uh, find your own, you know, way of doing things. This presentation is based on, you know, what I think works, both in terms of how I was trained and in terms of how I work. Uh, but, you know, I don't, I, I think there's always a million right answers in terms of how to, how to get things done. So allow yourself to, you know, to explore uh, what works uh, in terms of your own practice. Uh, but uh, if you are ever frustrated, then it's worth trying, uh, trying things my way. So the first thing I would say is something called active reading, which is to say you need to, you know, participate in reading and not just sort of uh, set your mind, uh, uh, in, in, you know, don't just set your eyes on each of the words and say, oh, well, that's it, I, I read this thing. And, and my goal uh, in, in terms of also, you know, uh, I'm talking about note taking, other people will talk about different things, but my goal overall is to try and break down the barrier between reading and writing. Because uh, it's oftentimes the case that if you have to write something, it, you feel stressed out about you're like, oh, what am I going to write? What do I have to say? How shall I organize, you know, things? Uh, but if you never experience subjectively, like, now I'm starting to write because you've so perfectly broken down the difference between reading and writing, then you never have writer's block and you never have the stress of, 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 of uh, not knowing what to write. So that's our goal is to break down the barrier between reading and writing. Okay. So one thing then is to write as you read. And I suggest doing that with a, a pen or a pencil, yeah, on the page you're actually reading as you read it. Uh, and then um, to, to also take notes on the, I wasn't quite sure what word to use, but you know, the, the first few pages of a book that don't actually say anything, like, <laughs> like the copyright page, the title page, Maybe there's some blank pages at the beginning. So, so take notes there so that you can look at the, let's, I'm assuming we're talking about a book, but it could be an article, right? In, in terms of an article, it would be like, usually there's a lot of space on the first page. You can take notes there that are your own sort of index to your own notes, right? So if you're reading and then you write something that you think is really brilliant or you you know, find a passage that you think is really exciting, and in particular that you'll have to refer back to later, maybe, then write a note at the very beginning of the document, uh, saying what page your, your, you know, particularly insightful note is, so that in the way the book itself has a table of contents, you have a table of contents to your own experience of reading the book. Yeah, that's a suggestion. And then similarly, you might, in the course of reading something, say like, uh, oh, this, this, this document that this person uh, refers to looks interesting. And, and you, might, you would note that in, in the place that it comes up, but you would also note it in the bibliography because, you know, I, and let's say I, I learned this one the hard way, which is that I was like, oh gosh, there's some book about this that I really wanna read. Uh, I should I should look up the citation, and then I had to find you know where in the book that thing was referred to to to, to find my note about it. So I think it's it's just a sort of helpful um, you know uh, belt and braces sort of safety measure to also put a little mark in the bibliography by the things that you um, you 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 think look interesting. And now you can do that by just you know glancing through the bibliography of uh, and say like oh what here looks interesting, but you have more information to decide what's interesting when you see how the author you're reading uses that citation in the actual argument. Yeah, so maybe something has a great title, but but the person's actually really stupid, right? Uh, and and you you don't know until you 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 try and read it. Uh, but in any case, I'm just saying, you know, uh, uh, yeah, as you read, you will see how something's used in an argument, and then you can put a note there. Uh, but you can also put a note in the bibliography. Okay, so now just some examples. Oh, let me see. Oh, yeah, right. And then, you know, I'm just anticipating the fact that you all might be saying, hey, look, buddy, you know, I can't write in books because I'm getting the books from the library. 
Yeah. And they, okay, well, don't, I'm not encouraging you to write in library books. Actually, you know, I mean, maybe I shouldn't say this, but if you're totally sure you will one day be really famous, then it's probably good to write in a library book because, <laughs> because people who have, you know, written in library books who would later go on to be famous, the, the university is actually kind of happy about that somehow. But, <laughs> but you know, I think you shouldn't be that arrogant. So, um, so don't write in library books. Yeah. Um, uh, but then what do, you, what do you do? All this advice I'm giving you doesn't apply. Well, what I do is, um, is, uh, is, oh, right, is I take notes on a vertically folded piece of paper that I sneak inside the book, right? So like I take a sheet of paper like this. Oops, sorry, because of the zoom filter, <laughs> the paper's disappearing, but there we go, you know, vertically folded piece of paper. And then you can sort of write on it and then stick it in the book, yeah? Now that's the trouble there is, you know, uh, when you're done reading the book, you have like two or three vertically folded piece of paper that you have to do something with, right? And, and I oftentimes, you know, have a bunch of those things sort of lying around the house. And, um, and that's fine for a kind of one-off project because you'll probably use them, right? But it's one reason why it's nicer to, to have the books is that then it's there forever, right? Like you, five years from now, you can say, gosh, where did I read that? And then you can see your notes, right? Whereas if you had just have vertically folded piece of paper, you can't do that, right? But anyhow. Can't let the perfect be the enemy of the good, but a vertically folded piece of paper is how you get around um, things uh, if you ha can't uh, if you can't um, uh, if you can't write in the library book. Okay, so then I just thought I would sort of prove you know that this is how I do things. <laughs> so so this is a book I I have read recently about the history of land use in the Qing Dynasty. And here's just a, a more or less randomly chosen page where you see uh, I've written all over it, yeah. And then in the bibliography, I've noted things that I thought looked interesting. Uh, and then at, this is the the kind of, you know, s sort of like the title page. It has the blurb about the author and whatnot. So as, as I read, I took notes on that page as an index to the notes that I had taken in, in the in the page and you know because i'm a sick person this is actually what i do for fun yeah like <laughs> like like I, like I didn't read this book because it's in any, in any particular way useful for my research or whatnot uh it's just a book that looked interesting and and this is how i read it so i feel embarrassed about just sounding like a dinosaur like oh you know uh don't use any <laughs> computer tools don't use anything uh, so that's not, you know, I'm not going to, I'm, I'm, I'm going to pretend that this is not just some sort of aesthetic decision on my part, uh, because I'm an old man, but instead say, I think that, so you can do other, like you can have other mediated experiences of, of reading, like on an iPad, for example. Yeah, that's no problem. But I think that writing by hand is really important sort of biologically almost that 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 when you write by hand you 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 are writing slower uh than if you type and that that's important because then it gives you sort of time to think as you're writing and i and i just i don't know i'm a big believer in you know of course we all write uh, mostly on uh on keyboards and on phones and things and that's fine uh but i think when reading, it's important to write in a way that, you know, that actually sort of violates the text you're interacting with. And you can only really do that writing by hand. And I think this is just good psychologically. Okay, so now <clears throat> that was active reading. Now adversarial reading, which is, you know, a kind of way of doing your active reading. Which is, uh, you should always try to disagree with what you're reading. And I think this is this is something that that doesn't come naturally to students. I think because of how high schools teach, where where you know you if if your high school physics book says, I don't know that force is mass times uh, velocity or something, you are not encouraged to say, oh yeah, prove it, you know. Um, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but that's what you that's how you you should at least in the humanities that's how you should approach things, right? 
always uh, uh, assume your, 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 that, that, I don't know, not that the person is wrong, but that, 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 that there is no benefit of the doubt to the author. So, uh, so in doing that, what does it mean? It means you should be looking for places where the author's logic doesn't make sense uh, constantly, right? You should be sort of read, as you read a paragraph, you say, ah, that doesn't make sense. That, that was not a warranted uh, leap. And then you ask yourself always, can the evidence that the author has presented be used to argue the opposite point? Yeah. Uh, I think it's, I don't know, uh, surprisingly often that this, <laughs> that this is the case. Yeah. So someone says, oh, you know, for example, here's a case where this happened. You think to yourself, ah, if, if I just assume that whatever the, the author's uh, argument clearly is, I want to prove the opposite. Could I use this same evidence to prove the opposite? And then, uh, okay. And then sort of, you know, similarly, but can you think about how the same evidence could be explained a different way? Uh, and I'm just saying kind of, uh, for example, with a different methodology or from a different ideological perspective. Yeah, so, um, you know, I, I, I think this is a useful way of sort of understanding authors is, you know, someone's a historian or someone's a, a sociologist or something. So they have certain methodological uh, approaches and they, um, and, and they will have their own ideological perspective. The argument in this book I was reading that, that I showed you uh, examples of before uh, is that um, kind of broadly speaking that Confucian values are part of why capitalism didn't develop in China. Yeah, but very specifically, because uh, uh, that's a really sort of a really silly uh, opinion to have, right? <laughs> uh, in, in terms of its, its essentialist um, uh, idea. Uh, so, so instead he actually had this much more sort of uh, uh, detailed argument about like Confucianism led to certain kinds of social structures and those social structures led to certain kind of land use regimes and then those land use regimes led to uh, the, the failure of capitalism to develop. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, uh, you might say, I don't know that, uh, oh yeah, 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 here's an example. He clearly had some sort of, um, Thought it was really important to uh, to explain everything in terms of of, of rational uh, choice theory, where like each individual historical actor is always doing what's good for his own economic self interest in a very sort of American neoliberal way, and and <laughs> and that was because he was coming from the so from the social sciences, yeah, which is tends to be how they how they do these things. Um, so. So the, I think that's the sort of thing I'm saying is just, you know, when he's saying like, oh, look, in this course case, court case, this happened, you know, it's important to understand his positionality as someone who's who's using a certain methodology certain and a certain ideology. Uh, yeah. So uh, remember that the purpose of research is to challenge and to expand uh, received wisdom, not to reproduce it. Right. So you're always looking for your you, you should always be aggressive and adversarial <laughs> in, in your approach to existing scholarship, because it's by finding uh, holes in uh, evidence or, or sort, of, sort of, you know, places where a conclusion has been made with insufficient evidence or with, uh, or with uh, faulty logic that you can contribute to the kind of social enterprise uh, of scholarship. And actually one, one thing that I also noticed with students is that they, they tend to think, well, you know, look, you know, I don't, you know, you know, here I'm reading this person who spent 20 years working on this kind of thing. And I'm reading this other person who, who's, 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 um, who's, who's very knowledgeable and has read all this stuff. And who am I to, 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 to form an opinion here, right? But I think that's, that's totally the wrong way of thinking. Instead, think of you know, books and articles as kind of, as kind of uh, uh, free floating in the sense that like, you know, maybe someone had better evidence, maybe someone is a really smart person, but they've just failed to write a good article, right? 
So, <laughs> so it, it, it's still perfectly valid for you to say, I didn't find this piece of logic convincing. Yeah. And then, and then in terms of finding your own ideas, the best thing to do is find authors who disagree with each other because by kind of bringing together uh, authors who disagree with each other, you are in the perfect position to kind of adjudicate where you say like, well, this one, you know, had uh, used this evidence and this one used this evidence, this one used this logic and this one used this other logic. And, and here's, you know, me as a reader, here's where I think each of them had failings. Yeah. And, and, and let's say, you, in a sense, you know, you, you, the easy way to, to, to work in this way is then you sort of, you sort of are the judge of, you know, who's right in some debate. Uh, but of course, actually, that's that would that that's that's kind of lazy in terms of it's not an overall judgment that matters. It's like, oh, it turns out, you know, author A is better than author B. No, uh, it, it, it's the judgment in the details that matters, right? Okay, so that was it in terms of, you know, actually, um, yeah, in terms of actually like how to take notes. So active reading, which is different places I think you should be writing basically down as you read things. Um, and then and then adversarial reading, which is the kind of posture you should take vis-a-vis -vis the thing you're reading, uh, which is, you know, disagreeable. Yeah. Uh, th that's, that's it in terms of how you actually take notes. But now you have a bunch of notes, right? So what do you do with them? Yeah. So you should gather them together. And I like to think about Wittgenstein uh, and then on the on the slide, you know, I've said the great Irish philosopher as a joke because he was Austrian uh, or English, but he did uh, work in Ireland for a couple important, uh, actually like seasons, yeah? And he died in, in Ireland, died in Dublin. But he, he, he had a little tiny hut uh, on the west coast of Ireland where he went to kind of be away from everyone. And it's always been one of my dreams to em emulate that. But I guess that's, <laughs> that's not the point. The point is, how did he work? So, uh, so he had a little notebook that, that he kept on him. This is particularly actually when he was in Ireland, but uh, you know, whatever. Um, he, he kept on him and he would go on walks. And then he would just sort of ruminate on his walks thinking about because he's a philosopher right so he didn't he didn't he didn't need to to read books to do research he just thought yeah um so so he would go on these long walks and then he would just take little notes into his little notebook that he could sort of fit into his pocket while he was on his long walk so that was his sort of an analogous to what i'm suggesting you know for you would be taking notes as you read yeah and then after he sort of filled these little notebooks uh, with just little fragments, he would copy the good ideas out in a more complete, more worked out way into a medium sized notebook. And he'd do that back at home. Yeah. So, you know, maybe, uh, maybe his little notebook had, you know, I don't know, uh, nonsense in it, like, like how much he paid for a sandwich or something. So then he thinks, well, I'm not going to put that in my medium sized notebook because I'm a philosopher. So I have to put, <laughs> I have to put the philosophy in the, in the medium sized notebook. And then, and then one thing that, that I can vouch for in terms of my own experience is if you do this, uh, you kind of cannot, uh, you know, you shouldn't, but you also can't, I don't think physically write exactly the same thing into the medium sized notebook as you do in the small notebook because it's too boring to do that. <laughs> so, so your mind naturally expands, rewrites, reformulates, uh, whatever the idea is in, in a way that's useful. This was, was why he did it, right? So then he had these medium-sized notebooks and then you guessed it, once he sort of filled up some medium-sized notebooks, he would have a, a big notebook <laughs> and into the big notebook would go, um, would go like complete, you know, paragraphs of sort of done-ish philosophy. Uh, and uh, if you if you know about, uh, you know, if, I don't know, if you're a Wittgenstein fan, you'll know that his books are called like the Brown Notebook. <laughs> and that's because that was the big notebook that was brown that he, put, you know, a bunch of, put a set of ideas in. And then there was another one like the blue notebook. Yeah. 
So, um, so and they're called that uh, in part because he only published one book in his life. So all these notebooks were never published. They were published after he died. So don't, uh, you know, model yourself too closely on Wittgenstein or you will never finish anything. Um, but I do think there's, there's a certain wisdom. Yeah. Which is to say, I'm not, yeah. So I, so, so what I do suggest is it copying notes by hand, uh, can be uh, helpful before typing them up into a computer. Yeah which is to say like almost think about like how awkward it would be if you had a book, you know, I have, I have a book and then I'm like flipping through the book, looking at my, my notes and like trying to type in the computer at the same time. It's not going to work. Yeah. So instead I think it's good to kind of have like a blank sheet of paper and then look through your notes, you know, especially you starting with the beginning of the book you read. Yeah. And then you can sort of write out longer ideas or passages you might want to quote or something like that on the blank sheet of paper. And then when you actually go to type, go from the blank, the sheet of paper rather than from the, from the actual book, you know, and, and like partly that's because I think it's physically more convenient, but I also think you will naturally formulate better, more mature ideas when you copy your notes uh, in the way that Wittgenstein worked. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so let's say sort of light Wittgensteinian methodology here. I don't, I don't think you should go on long walks with tiny notebooks and then copy them into medium-sized notebooks and then copy those into large-sized notebooks and then die. Yeah, um, but what I do think is that just just tell yourself sort of that that when it's not clear to you whether you should do something by hand or on the computer, just err a little bit on the side of copying out by hand. Uh, because I think that that has a lot to recommend. Okay. Yeah, and that one thing is that ensures that you have you know more. Yeah, you know you, you, your idea that your ideas that go into your computer are more yours. That's the point that I wanted to make. There is like, I I I see a lot of people take notes uh, in like into a computer that are just sort of summarizing the argument of of uh, books, right? And like, that seems like, you know, I don't know, it might be good if you're trying to sell your notes to people who don't want to do the reading or something like that. <laughs> uh, but but it's it's kind of a waste of your time, yeah? Like, the, the point is when you actually go to write something, you want it to be yours, yeah? So, so rather than you know, just sort of take notes into the computer that summarize what it is you've been reading. You want to keep things away from the computer for a while until you've sort of taken ownership of them and they've been mediated by your own ideas and then write your own ideas into the computer. Yeah. There is a risk in, in following my, you know, advice, which is uh, that you will lose track of what's yours and what's uh, the idea of the of the original author, uh, and you know, if you do that too much, then you will commit plagiarism, <laughs> and that's why the the next hour is about uh, what is plagiarism, how to avoid uh, plagiarism, and whatnot, and and, um, and so I think that there's a, a natural tension there, which is you know you you have to uh, at the moment of turning in an assignment, you have to be totally sure that the exact words being used are either in quotes and credited to whoever said them or that they're an invention of your own yeah um, but uh, you can uh, you can you can create processes uh, to safeguard against pl plagiarism like always keeping track of, of the page number that you take something from uh, but you can also kind of uh, do a certain amount of ex post facto, uh, checking, right? Like if, if you are reading something and think like, uh, wait, uh, maybe that's not, maybe, maybe that's a sentence that I actually, you know, copied from the book uh, and have now lost track of where I got it from. You can, you can find it and you can check whether it's exactly, uh, you know, what the person said or not. But I guess I won't say anything more about that because that's Peter's job to help you avoid plagiarism. Um, uh, but I just want to say that, that I, I think that almost if you're not 
experiencing a small risk of committing plagiarism, then you're not doing enough integration of the ideas into your own mind, right? Like, don't be so scared of plagiarism that you don't, that you just sort of mechanically, you know, repeat things and put them nicely in quotes and paraphrase them or not. You, ha you have to, to somehow, you know, take ownership of things and ingest them and then, and then create something new. Yeah. And I think that, that, um, uh, that if you, if you follow my advice, uh, you, that will happen naturally. So now at the computer. So remember that what you write is private until you decide to share it with someone else. So that means that your sort of, your sort of sense of potential social anxiety can be, you can, you can, you can have that totally gone, right? While you're writing an essay, you can fill it with swear words if you want. Yeah, you can you can write about how boring it is to be doing the assignment. Yeah, no one will know. <laughs> so so just feel totally free to write whatever you want, and then get something out on the paper. The way I think of it is. Um, that uh, let, let's, let's see, the real art of writing is actually editing, which is like being a sculptor. But a sculptor needs a big chunk of ugly rock. Yeah. So <laughs> the, the, and then the sculptor takes the big chunk of uh, ugly rock and kind of works it away into some, you know, fine, beautiful thing. Right? But when you are writing, you start from nothing. You start from a blank sheet of paper. So your first goal is to make a big, ugly hunk of rock. And that's where you should feel totally free, totally unjudgmental uh, of yourself. Yeah. And just, and if it's, and do whatever happens, you yeah? know, almost stream of consciousness. You know, if, if you feel nervous, have a drink, you know, just get something out on the page. And then you can polish the writing and organization later. And I'll, I'll tell, tell you, like, I mean, this isn't, uh, you know, necessarily advice, but uh, but in my experience, I usually write about twice the length of the thing I'm aiming for. So if I'm aiming for a 10 page article, I write 20 pages um, uh, and then and then hone that down. Yeah. OK. And then just again about myself, uh, this process of sort of writing and editing, writing and editing. For me, like for a published paper, usually goes through about 10 or 20 different versions. So, um, you know, so I don't, I think that, that probably, you know, you're not planning to publish your <laughs> MA dissertations. So probably you can have it be less than that. <laughs> um, also, you probably don't have the time for, you know, 20 different versions, but I'm just saying like, that's, I don't know, that's, don't worry about, uh, thinking like, oh, I have to write this and finish the draft, right? Uh, instead, just think of it as a very organic, iterative process. But in order to do that, you have to, you know, start early and <laughs> and chip away at it, yeah. Uh, because if you only have two days left, uh, then yeah, then you're in trouble. Some of the techniques that people use a lot of the time, like you know, uh, kind of notes that really summarize readings and, and and writing outlines of your argument and then filling those outlines in. I think those are the sorts of techniques that 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 have been developed because of time pressure. Uh, and then I think, well, you know, uh, uh, if you have the time, you can follow, you know, my method. Uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, it's because it's it's because I think it's easy my or i'm trying to convince you that the way i do things is easy in terms of if you break down this difference between reading and writing as much as possible and you you have this very this very free you know liberated approach to writing where you're not judging yourself and you 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 allow yourself to write you know swear words or nonsense um it, it's easy but uh that that sort of easiness of the experience uh, is the downside, but it's, it's time consuming. So you have to, 
allow uh, the time for it. So the other thing I would say is in the actual process of writing, also, you should not always be at the computer. And, and, and partly this is just a mental health thing, right? Like you're all spending too much time in front of a computer anyhow. But I, but I, I even mean like, you know, not in the coronavirus time. Don't spend too much time in front of your computer. And I'll just tell you the way I work is so I write at the computer for a couple hours and then I feel you know, uncomfortable or bored or whatever. And then I print out what I've written. And then I read what I've printed out in a different place. I think that's really important because just like you'll get sick of being in the same room and, and, and your, your, you need to, you know, sort of almost like wearing a different hat. You need to say, now I'm an author. Now I'm an editor. So like that might be like, I'm an author in my bedroom and I'm an editor in the living room. Yeah, but I think that difference of location is really important. Uh, in the past, what I most like to do is, uh, is, is do the, the reading of my own writing in a cafe around the corner. And the reason I like to do that is to just, you know, get a little fresh air and whatnot, uh, but also to feel the social pressure to not fall asleep. <laughs> You know, <laughs> that like, that like if I just sort of, if I just sort of lay down on the floor and, and fall asleep or something, I can't do that in a cafe. Yeah. It would be socially unacceptable. So, um, so that little, and, and, you know, and if you, if you were reading something and writing on it in a cafe and you have a, you know, a cup of coffee, whatnot, you can sort of feel like you're being a, a sort of glamorous urbanite and maybe the other people around will, who are, you know, whatever, uh, 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 trying to publish their their novels or whatever they'll say oh i wonder what he's writing yeah anyhow i find that little bit of social anxiety <laughs> helpful in that editing process so so, so i like to do that in a in, in cafe uh, but at least in the living room and then you have to treat yourself in exactly the way you would treat a, 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 another author right so experience alienation you know once you've written something once you've written something and printed it out it's not yours anymore it's, it exists in the world and should be approached mentally just like anything else which means you should read it actively and you should read it adversarially right you should you should say you know in my case who is this nathan character who's written this utter garbage all this all these swear words and this nonsense yeah <laughs> uh, and then you 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 know write on it and it's cross things out and you say this is bad logic and this is bad evidence and you know just be as mean as possible to yourself as an editor and then i think that that you know for me uh, at least uh, but this is also how i was taught back in back in school uh, that 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 difference that sort of split personality I'm the author and I'm so gentle and easy on myself uh, and feel so free and creative in front of the computer. And then I'm an editor and, and I'm, I'm small minded and, and, and arrogant and judgmental uh, and impatient and not in front of the computer. Uh, I think that separation and then bouncing between those two is an extremely uh, productive uh, sort of way of working. Uh, and then when you return to the computer, you have that advice that you gave yourself and you can incorporate it. You can do this even if you're not feeling creative, right? Like, like if you're sleepy, if you're bored, you can listen to music. You can even maybe like listen to uh, something with content like the radio or something and just follow the advice of the former you, yeah, who says, uh, use this word here, put a comma here, uh, you know, uh, improve, put, put a citation here. You can just sort of be obedient to the, your editor. And, uh, and then that's a way of squeezing work out of you when you're not feeling very creative. Now, the trouble is uh, that editor might have big comments, might say like, um, you know, you, you should read this book or, or, or might say, um, you know, give another example or something like that. And then for those things, you need to be, uh, you need to be back in that, in that, in that author mode where you're, 
where you're free and you're and you're creative and you have a certain amount of energy, right? So uh, so I don't know. So it depends on on what you're doing there. But I'll say, in in my experience, then um, I have to sort of take a measure of my own energy level. And if I don't have uh, high energy, then I can, you know, fix the bibliography. I can add some commas. I can do some sort of small edits that need to happen. So it's a good use of time to do them even when you have low energy. If I have higher energy, I go straight for those, those bigger uh, recommendations that the editor me made. But then how do you keep track of it? Which is to say like, like what if I'm sort of, you know, low enough energy that I'm doing the small things and then I run into a piece of advice that I gave myself and I'm like, I just don't have it in me today to do that. Personally, what I do is then I write a comment in all caps so that then I later can kind of just scan through the document really quickly and see where I've said in all caps what to, what to do. Yeah. And, th and then your sort of, you know, low energy self can kind of, uh, you know, um, put these all caps demands on a future higher energy self. Uh, and then this whole process, uh, you just repeat again, and again. Yeah. So, <laughs> so you know, the, this is what this is. What, this is how I work. Yeah. So, yeah. I, I I write in this very free, deliberated way. Then I I print out the nonsense that I've written. Then I read it in a very critical way. Then I try to you know follow the advice that that critical editor has given me. Uh, to some extent mechanically and to some extent in a way that requires that that free creative uh, you know energy and I'll say actually that that's a place where it's important to kind of uh, remind yourself of the advice you know because let's say I do experience uh, writer's block I do experience anxiety about writing and it's at that moment where where I'm like partly just following the advice of my own edits and partly having to be creative. And then when I notice myself experiencing those, those negative feelings, I say, okay, then the problem is I have to decide, am I revising in, in a kind of mechanical way or am I writing new material in a kind of free way? And then, you know, and, and then you can get through the, the sort of blockage in that way. You just decide what's my energy level, what kind of mood am I in, which of these two activities am I gonna do? Anyhow, so then through that process of repetition at some point, you know, you have a, 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 a brilliant, uh, logical, well-organized uh, piece of writing uh, that is, uh, you know, well-researched and full of original, brilliant ideas. Yeah. So, <laughs> uh, and you can, you know, as long as you leave yourself enough time, you can let that be a sort of, you can let the, the, the document almost tell you what your argument is and tell you how to organize itself. Whatnot. Although actually, you know, let's say uh, other people will be giving you advice that I hope uh, pulls in a slightly different direction because, you know, certain patterns of organization are quite standard and you should be aware of those and, and whatnot. But I do think that, that this sort of organic approach is a way to kind of let, um, let yourself be led by, by the process rather than trying to sort of dictate it in advance. Yeah. Uh, you know, you can imagine the sort of different marks that a uh, dissertation gets, right? 70 is the cutoff for a first because 70 is already a first. This is in, in the UK system. No one ever gives like a 90, right? Because what's the point? Because <laughs> it's, a, it's already a, a, an honors, yeah? Uh, but but uh, what, uh, what those higher numbers are used for is to tell a student, like, this is so good, you should publish it. That's how it works uh, in my experience so far. And I would say that it's, you know, I don't know. I've seen that mm, two or three times in my 10 years. That's totally fine to cherry pick. There's no way you'll read everything that's ever been written on something. Start with what's ever easiest. You somehow became aware of that topic. So start there. And then you read things and then you see what they cite and then you read. It's easy. There, there's sort of reading backwards in time is easy, right? Because you can just read what other people cite. Yeah. 
uh, then what you do find yourself, uh, what can be hard is like, how do you know if someone has, you know, recently published something that the people you're reading haven't read uh, that's super relevant and exciting? And that used to really be a problem, but now it's not because we have Google, Google Scholar and Google Scholar will tell you. That if something's been cited in the past, it doesn't mean it's good, but it means it's worth considering because it's sort of part of the story of how the discipline has unfolded. Uh, whereas if something was published last week uh, by a crackpot, you know, maybe you shouldn't waste your time with it. But, um, but that's something you can judge yourself. Um, citing things not in English, you know, in this case, probably in Chinese, is, is a nice way of looking like a smarty pants. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but... <laughs> But but I like to to do that in you know as many languages as possible. Maybe because I'm a yeah. linguist, but maybe because I I want to look like a smarty pants. And it's easy to do now because of things like Google Translate and OCR yeah. and whatnot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This was isn't in the PowerPoint, uh, and maybe I should you know turn turn off the film. But I'll tell you, uh, in terms of finding things, okay, so so there, there are two senses in which you can find something. One is you have to know of its existence, right? Mm -hmm. So if you know of its existence, you know, a, a bibliography that, of something you've already read is, is a good place, or uh, something like Google Scholar, yeah? Or, yeah. Uh, but once you know of something's existence, how do you actually get your hands on it? So most things now have a DOI associated with them, right? Digital object identifier. Um, and so you can find yourself to, to your way to any kind of, let's say to the publisher's homepage, right? So, mm -hmm. so you're on some journal homepage or whatnot, and then you'll see, oh, here's an article and then there'll be a DOI. Mm -hmm. uh, now, uh, what you uh, should tell you to do is then you check whether, you know, Trinity subscribes to that journal or you look in some Trinity database or something like that. Mm. But actually, it's much faster if you go to something called Sci-Hub, which is a illegal Russian site, yeah? Mm. Um, and, <laughs> and you can just Google, like, uh, it moves around, uh, but it it's always has a simple address, like it's Sci, S-C-I hyphen, hub and then dot something, dot se or dot si or dot tw, yeah. Um, but you can always, if you want to know, you just Google something like where is Sci-Hub uh, and then the internet will tell you where Sci-Hub is. Yeah. And they have about 95% of all articles, you know, in all disciplines. <laughs> <laughs> and and I, I find it's just, it's just so much faster. Oh, and it's just a search box and you just plop the DOI in, just the DOI number, yeah? Okay, so so I found the title of some article somewhere. That's, we will leave a mystery. So I, I put that into Google and then I see it here at its publisher's homepage, right? And then I say, oh, look, uh, this nice article. Oh, here's the DOI. Okay, so then I copy back to the, N, and then, and there's Sci-Hub, yeah? And then I just drop that number in there, and the article comes right up, right? There it is. <laughs> so that is just so fast and easy. So for books, there's another site called Library Genesis. So we say library genesis, and then we go here, for example. Okay, and then here I'll just say uh, the Chinese, Tibetan, Burmese. I'm gonna, I'm trying to get my own book here. Oh, and then see, well, here's here it has it, yeah. So, so there it is, historical phonology of Tibetan, Burmese, Chinese, and then you go over to all these little mirrors, and then. You know, I usually choose the second one for whatever reason, uh, and then I, and then here we go, and then, and then you hit get, and then you will download that book. Yeah. So, SciHub for articles, and Library Genesis for books. The the 
issue though is that um, uh, library genesis doesn't isn't nearly as good as sci-hub so so sci-hub really has like 95 percent of all articles ever published anywhere whereas library genesis like only really has books in english and it only really has books in english published since like the mid 90s or later yeah. and then i should say you know if any of this is illegal in your jurisdiction then don't do it <laughs>